Hi, I'm Maria Fadiman, and I'm really excited to be talking with you all today. The last time I was on the playa, I was handing out chocolate with the lost penguins. So today it's different as I'm coming to you from my bedroom and I'm handing out stories. I'm handing out something for all of us to think about during this time and at any time. So let us get into what we're gonna talk about. All right, so humans connecting with the land. I'm gonna talk about plant use in the Amazon and in the African savanna. So I do ethnobotany. And when you say you're an ethnobotanist, people look at you, go, huh? So ethno, people, botany, plants. So people's relationship with plants. And again, the Burning Man crowd, you all have probably a certain sense of what this is. And in this case, I'll be talking about fiber, talk about food, you can talk about construction, talk about the use of medicine. And there's also ritualistic uses. Now, a lot of these are here, so we think of an example. When people say, oh, you have to go way out in the forest, the Amazon for the ritualistic use. And um, if we think about something we do at the end of October, and we use a very specific plant, and it's round, and it's orange, and we even know what you do with it. It would be triangle shaped. And then we take a candle and we put that inside this plant, and then we put it outside of our house. Now, that's not a ritual. And it has to be that plant. If I say, well, I work in the Amazon, so I'm going to carve a, uh, a plant, a, a snake out of a zucchini. Eh. We can't do that because it has to be a pumpkin. And it has to be that time of year. So we're very ritualistic with plants in many ways. Um, here or wherever here is for you. And then there are some uses that are, that are hard to describe or to categorize. And I do a lot of my work in Ecuador and I'm out in the rainforest and I work with different families. And often after I've been working with them for a long time, they want to give me something. So once I got a banana, once I got an egg, and then there was a family with whom I've been working for a long time and they wanted to give me something really special. So they came out of their house with a big duck. Wah, wah, wah. And I thought, wow, thank you so much. I've always really needed a duck. And so I'm carrying this duck wah, wah, and I'm carrying it. And um, as soon as we're out of sight from the family, uh, Don Jorge, who is in the picture here, he knows there is no way I'm carrying a duck eight hours through the mud. <laughs> trying to make it back to the biological station. So he says, and he takes a leaf, and he takes a vine, and he wraps up that duck, and he hooks it on the back of his backpack. And so for, for eight hours, I am face to face with this duck, because it's and I'm hiking behind. But using those plants to wrap up the duck, that's ethnobotany. And so here, here's the duck, all bundled up. And we look at uses of plants that are just really common to us that we, we almost don't think about. So food, so for example, corn comes from Latin America originally and we have it in all kinds of forms now. And um, this is during my junior year abroad, I was living with a family in Mexico and the grandmother would take the dry corn, corn cobs and she would rub them together and the corn kernels would fall and they would go onto a, the, the blanket and then she would take those to be made into tortillas at the tortilleria. So she is busy doing that, but if you'll notice, there's somebody who is hiding behind one of these sacks. And the minute the grandmother walks away, whoa! So the next time you eat a tortilla, you just think of a sweaty little boy rolling around in your food. So much of my work is in the rainforest. And when I first arrived, I was told very clearly there are many things about which I needed to be afraid. So there's snakes, so be very careful where you walk. And there's scorpions, so don't put your hand under anything. They'll get you. Spiders, spiders are everywhere. 
And I appreciate the role spiders play in the ecosystem. I just personally don't, don't prefer spiders. So the first night I walked carefully back to where I was staying, the loft area. And I thought about the, the forest and all of these aspects. But first I checked my sleeping bag to make sure nothing was in it. And I laid there and I made a calendar in my head of all the nights I would be there with a big star on the day I was going home. Because I thought, I think, I think I hate this. And then in daylight and with time, and I did get to know the forest and the animals and the water and the birds and the snakes, and I saw that it was all part of this ecosystem. And I, and I fell in love with it. And it was people who were teaching me their knowledge. It was people who were teaching me about the forest. I fell in love with the forest through their guidance. And I realized that they're a part of the ecosystem as well. And we have to include them in the equation if I'm looking at conservation as a whole. So this is a Schwarman in, um, in the Amazon in Ecuador. Now, didn't mean I fell in love with everything that was in the, uh, in the Amazon. So we're walking along and I'm literally falling out of a, a tree um, is a tarantula. Now I still, I still don't prefer spiders. And, um, <clears throat> but we all take pictures because that's what you do when you're, 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 you're interested in everything that's out there and I'm trying to act cool. And then someone said, you know, we need something for scale, something of a known dimension that will tell us the scale of, of the spider. So it's not some tiny little spider I'm trying to make look big here. So someone said, how about a pencil? Good idea. And then someone said, well, you throw the pencil. And I said, well, I'm not throwing anything. Why don't you put the pencil by the spider? And they said, well, I'm not, I'm not. So we all did that. So finally I said, all right. And I took the pencil and I tossed it ever so gently near to her and whoa, boom, pencil attack. She jumped on it. We all jumped back. Ah, and then we all remembered we were supposed to look cool. So we got closer and we took our pictures. And then there was the following question. Can you take this? pencil from the spider. I'm not taking the pencil, you take the pencil. So we all looked at each other, we're all conservationists, and just without a word, we just walked. So we figured she earned the pencil, and yes, that is the one time I littered in the middle of the beautiful Amazon. But how I got into ethnobotany and really this relationship with plants and people, I was with the Guayami, an indigenous group in Costa Rica. And there was one woman who always used to walk around crunched over. And they used to call her La Nefermita, the little sick one. And one day they finally procured a, a Western doctor's appointment for her. They pooled their money and a group of them left the village, went through the forest, through the fields, into the town, to the doctor's office. The rest of us waited at the top of the hill. End of the day, came up over the forest and La Enfermita, Marta, she said, I'm cured. I said, that's wonderful. And she had her head held up high. And she said, yes, the doctor gave me medicine. And she opened her hand and there in a small plastic bag were six Advil. And clearly this was no cure. This was gonna make her feel better for a few hours. And I, and I started to walk away and her sister came up after me and she said, she said, my father knew how to cure from the rainforest, but we don't know anymore. So I realized it's important to record this information so that it's not lost. And the idea is if people use the forest, they understand the forest. If they understand the forest, they'll value the forest. So keeping this knowledge alive is important for the people also to protect the forests in which these plants grow. So how do you do that? Well, one way is first to understand the locals. What, what, is, what are happening with the people there? So this is um, down the road and we were walking through the forest and I looked up and I saw this toucan, this beautiful bird, and I said, toucan. And Ro looked at me and he said, Tukan! And I was very excited that I was the one who had finally pointed something out. 
And I turn around and he's there and he's got his gun poised, ready to go and <coughs> boom. He went over and picked up the toucan and he said, dinner. And I thought, oh my gosh. But then I thought, who am I to judge? I go to the supermarket for my dinner. So you have to learn about the people. I had to learn about the people with whom I was working. And I also realized I wanted to work with sustainability. What can you collect and you can keep collecting from the forest? And unless you have a lot of toucans, that's not gonna be it. And other groups with whom I was working, the Warani, and again, having to learn who these people really are. They're touted as very traditional and in certain ways, some of them are. And as you can see, these children, they're dressed in some very traditional clothes, but you also see you know, one of them's got board shorts on and sweatpants. And so truly they are a mixture. And I got it's important to really see where people are. Culture is fluid. And I have to meet them where they are. So leaving the rainforest, and then my anthropology classes, they always said, you know, don't go native. So clearly I have totally defied all of that and I've gone as native as I can, but then I climbed onto an airplane. And we're now heading out of the rainforest into Africa. So in Tanzania, in Africa, there's a proverb, when an elder dies, a library burns. And there's a similar proverb in, in most cultures. So we thought, let's build a library. But that's a lot of work. So then we decided, let's make a booklet. So, and just to, uh, to talk about with whom I was working, Grace Gobbo, she, she and I did this project together. So what, what were the goals of the project? We wanted to create a lasting record of plant knowledge so it's not lost. And we also want the younger generation to get excited. It's the elders who have the knowledge. And again, this is, these are their forests. This is their traditional knowledge. And it's for them to own. And it's that same idea, if we can encourage their understanding that encourages their valuing it, that encourages conserving the forest in which they live. Now, when I first got there, I got this little used bicycle as a way to get around. And it was much smaller than I was, and I would be biking around, and I had to go through a village to get to where I was staying. And it was in the very beginning, and I had my bike trundling through that fine, dust that they have in this part of Africa. And suddenly children start coming out from all of the different huts and they start coming towards me and they're shouting, Uzungu, Uzungu, which is basically foreigner. And this is the moment I'm gonna connect with the people and I'm feeling it and they're all running and rushing towards me and I panic. And I start bicycling faster and faster and I'm trying to get away and they're chasing me in the fence. I'm zungu, I'm zungu. and I'm biking, I'm biking, I'm biking. And I was so embarrassed. I was so disappointed in myself. And um, I learned some words. I learned how to say, you know, please don't unzip my backpack. Please don't grab my camera. And I also learned how to say, yes, you can touch me. Yes, you can touch my hair. Yes, you can touch my bike. So eventually we developed a really fabulous relationship and every day when I would come through and they would all run out and I would stop. So who were these people? And aha. And uh, this is in the western part of Tanzania, lake, near Lake Tanganyika. And I was working in the village of Buwango. And it's particularly interesting because it's near Gombe Stream National Park. Now Gombe Stream National Park there's a certain kind of ecosystem. So there's the Miombo woodlands and the people are doing some farming and they are planting and collecting oil palms. And there's also deforestation. It's a woman who's collecting wood for firewood to cook their food. And people use the trees for construction. And this has this extra importance because Gombe National Park this is where Jane Goodall did her research. And this is where the chimpanzees with whom she worked and the chimpanzees are still living in this forest. 
Now, I was working in Bubanga, which is just over the hill from Kombe, where the chimpanzees live. And we came over to, to look at the vegetation and do some comparisons. And they said, well, you have to come see the chimpanzees. And um, okay, so we're hiking, we're hiking, we're going uphills and downhills, and I'm so thirsty, and uphills and downhills. And we're on hour seven, and I'm so tired, and I'm so thirsty, and I think, I really don't care if I see it. And they said, no, 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 you can't leave without seeing chimpanzees. And I thought, yeah, actually, I could. Coming in, coming through the forest. It's now 14 chimpanzees, which is large for a group, come trundling through the forest. And it gives you the chills. I'm sitting there and I'm looking. And she turns and she looks at me. And they've told me, you can't approach a chimpanzee, but if they approach you, that's okay. And as she's looking at me, she gets up and she starts to walk towards me. And I'm looking at her and I think, hi, I am the gym whisperer. Here she comes and she gets closer and she leans down and she picks up a rock and throws it at my head. Whoa! And then one of the, uh, the park guards looks at me and he said, oh yeah, they don't like it when you, when you look at them. <laughs> Great, okay, thanks for telling me now. So I think, I think I'm gonna stick with them. But here I am going out to my study site and um, I clearly I'm excited to be on a motorcycle. That's somewhat new for me. But also, we're going to talk with the importance of the motorcycle drivers. And as they're taking, taking us out there, they say, well, why, why are you coming out to this village? What is your project? So we explain to them, looking at the relationship between plants and people. And when we got to the, uh, the village, we had to make sure that they had an interest in this project. And they said, yes. Yeah. They said the children are not learning about how to use plants. They only care about their cell phones. Now they don't have any electricity out here, but they have little solar powered batteries and they charge their phones there. So we're interviewing and uh, the elders, these are the people with most of the information. And there's some examples like plants for musical instruments. And there's another group that's becoming interested. The little peekers. So we're talking with the elders in this room and the kids are super curious. What is happening? What are they asking? And this curiosity, that's what we wanted. We wanted them to say, why would we be asking their elders about the plants? Why is that so important? And they began to watch. So this is as we're collecting and pressing plants. And you have villagers watching, and you have children who are watching. And as we're interviewing, and he's actually got the medicinal, I mean, the musical plant there, and uh, the motorcycle drivers, they take us out there. They have nothing to do while we're there before they take us back. So they come with us. And um, yes, that man behind there, his, shoot, his shirt does say, he says, it says, please tell your boobs to stop staring at my eyes. And whether or not you feel that's appropriate, it's up to you, but to understand he doesn't speak English. So um, the message to him is irrelevant. So the children are curious and they're watching. We want them to be actively engaged. So we go to the schools and we just start off with who used plants today and boom, clearly they all did very connected to the plant world around them. And we also wanted to tap into children's interest. So we brought materials for drawing. And I thought all children love to draw. They're all gonna wanna draw these plants. And Grace informed me, if you make it a contest, then you'll really get their interest. So here we are buying prizes. And we're buying school supplies. Those are the, the prizes. And just to notice this man, um, who again asks us, what are we doing? What, what is our project? So we're explaining the drawing portion to, to the villagers and this man is the head of village education. So he is now holding the plant and we're talking about for what it is used.
and he's in a room full of healers. So you now have the head of education interested in the use of their plan. And so through the education system, we're getting the, the kids involved and they're drawing them and they're connecting to the plant. You have to look at the plant, you have to envision it, and then you have to draw what you see. And we also wanted language to be a big part of this. Language is a huge part of culture. So you can see down there, this is in Kiha, and that is the tribal language of this group. And then we have the teachers. They're the ones who are now judging the, uh, the drawings. So now you have teachers who are thinking about the uses of plants and getting involved with the ethnobotany. And here we heard them talking, and, and I don't understand very much Kiha, I'm learning my Kiswahili, but I heard Kiha, Kiha, Kiha. And we began to realize that language was huge for these people. So this is someone named Rashidi, and we were in the town of Kigoma, and we brought him in, and we were working with translating uh, Kiswahili to Kiha to English to put these in the book. And so the final book, the first language, is Kiha. That's important to us and for, for all people. And then uh, we had plant lists, additional plants, uh, to work on their identifications, to, to look at, at all of these botanical aspects, but also really looking at the conservation and accessibility aspects as well. But the value we were focusing on in this situation, the connection to the people and these plants. So we had a huge ceremonial presentation. And if you'll notice what they have all around their ankles are that, that same musical instrument. Tap, and rat a tat tat and they sing and they jump, and it makes music as they go. And you can see all of these people, we wanted it to be a big event. And all this noise and hoopla, we wanted to attract people to say, hey, what's going on? What is this? What's so important? And so we have these people, if you'll notice though, some of the people who are inside the building, they're actually a bit captive, not quite as captive as they appear, but they had come to work with the chief about land titles that day. And the chief had double booked himself that this was also the day he'd said for us to do the ceremony. So he just stopped what he was doing, left the office, came out for the ceremony. So some of these people were here for for something else originally. But whatever brought each person, they're paying attention. They're absorbed. And as we gave the books to the ethnobotanical specialists, the people with whom we had been interviewing, we want their continued discussion, and that's what we want, keeping this information alive and relevant. And when you see the response, when you see the look on someone's face, when they see their words, uh, their forest knowledge, in their own language, there's nothing like it. And then there were others. So this was a gentleman, we had no idea who he was. He got a hold of a book and he's clearly holding court, explaining about the plants to the people. And that's exactly what we want. And we went to the schools. We had a ceremony there and they're now getting the books. They're interested, they're curious. What is the information? What are the pictures? Who won the drawing contest? And then we took it beyond Bubango, beyond this, this village. And we're now in the town of Kigoma, the, the biggest town nearby. And this is a Western trained doctor who wanted a copy. And we went to the Jane Goodall Institute and they wanted copy. And this is the guy who sells processed food. And you might think, okay, why is that important? But in a town where there's very few things coming from outside, he's actually very influential in many circles. The priests, they wanted a copy of the book. And here's the man in the stationery store. And we explained the project and he said, I heard it was in Kiha. And he wanted a book. And then we hear from the back of the store, I want a book, Kiha. And so for his helper, he also wanted a book. And then other villages 
asked us to come and make books with them of their plant knowledge. And so we did. We went back and we worked in the village of Wangungal. And again, this whole, you value the plant, you value the forest. And just as an example, this is 10 years growth. That area is protected and you can see the difference. So we can make a difference. And the idea is for future generations. So they have access to their own information. And this can be anywhere. So this, these were examples from the Amazon in Africa. These are redwood trees. I'm originally from Northern California. This is a plant with which I connect. We all connect to plants. And we can do that wherever we are. So just some thank yous to, to the people who helped make this project possible. And this is, uh, they're dancing in the rain. So, um, thank you so much for, for going on this trip with me and uh, for all of us connecting with plants, connecting with the land, connecting with the earth. Um, and it can be right in your front yard. It can be a bush you see. It can be a weed growing in the sidewalk. It can be a plant that you have in your, in your home, a little house plant. We appreciate the spices that you have in your cupboard, those two are plants. Um, so we can all connect to plants wherever we are at any time. So thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your time.